Hello everyone and welcome to the 20th episode in the series of things you may have missed in The Witcher 3. Oh boy, another one. What's that? This video will be the last one that is fully dedicated to Blood and Wine. Obviously I haven't exhausted every single detail of this expansion, but I'm nearly there and to be honest, I really want to go back to the other parts of the game. I started recording my first Blood and Wine episode in September last year. And since then, 99% of my time in The Witcher 3 has been exclusively in this expansion. So I'll give it a bit of a rest and go back to recording interesting things in the base game. But first, I still have some curious details to share with you about Blood and Wine. And just like the last episode, a lot of them are brought to you by my viewers. And speaking of the last episode, if you've missed any of the previous 19 videos in this playlist, feel free to check the link in the description. And of course, this one will likely be full of big spoilers, so tread carefully. Alright, without further delay, let's get started with Thing You May Have Missed in Blood and Wine number 1. And it is once again about Oriana. If you've seen my video of her, you should know about the potential vampire cult that exists within Toussaint. Well, it turns out that there's another very interesting clue about that. This one is brought to you by a viewer called Isha Das, or Aisha perhaps? Anyway, you know how, normally, if you take Oriana's path, you go to her mansion and then turn right to talk to her. However, if you turn left instead and go to where you were throwing paintballs during the masquerade, you'll stumble upon a group of people on their knees, worshipping before a drawing of several creatures, half of which look very much like higher vampires, potentially in their bat forms. Virtues! You knights have forsworn the virtues! The gods have seen fit to punish us all! I'm not entirely sure if those are wings or arms. They kind of look like arms with very long fingers. But then again, that's basically what bat wings are. However, if you look at Detlaf, he does have both arms and wings in his ultimate form. If you acknowledge any gods, start praying now! As for the other four bodies, I assume they're dead humans? Although their heads and feet look somewhat peculiar. I suppose the whole thing may just be an act of desperation, an attempt to appease the vampires somehow, so they can spare Beauclair. But given what we saw at Oriana's orphanage during the day, as well as in front of the Cockatrice Inn, there may be more to this whole situation. If you have any ideas, I'd love to know. Alright, for number two, I have a couple of details about the palace gardens. Both of them involving animals. And both can be seen during the hunt for the golden fish and the unicorn's horn in the beginning of the expansion. Fuck a doodle do. The first of them, brought to you by a viewer called Cam and Minipeg. You may remember her from my details missed about Care Moran video. And the thing here is that there is a Zeracanian leopard right by the big lake with the golden fish in it. What is Behold, they call the you? leopard from Get far them. away Zeracania. A predator wild, bloodthirsty and ferocious. Beauty and grace embodied in murderous form, like nothing else. A splendid beast. So fierce. And the second thing is brought to you by Ellen, located right about here, is a man training a dog. It's a curious scene, I don't recall ever seeing anything like that. And that's all I have for number two. Moving on to the next one. Number three is... Um, a rather weird joke, I suppose. It's about Milton's grave. You've probably seen it. He's buried in the main graveyard inside Beauclair. More or less the same place where you do the quest called... Uh, what was his name? Till death do you part? But anyway, here's the thing. On his gravestone, there is an inscription written in glagolic letters, and it says, Mind the gap. Alright, in number four, we'll have a look at the contract called Father Knows Worst. There are a couple of curious things worth mentioning in here, and both are in case you get what I'll call the best ending, where you resolve the matter without any fighting, and the brothers end up making peace. First off, you can later find them at Beauclair inside the Clever Clogs Inn. Ah, oh, Witcher, greetings. What brings you here? 
See you made up with your brothers. Looks like business is good. All true, all true. I cannot complain. We'd been rivals all our lives. So, at first, it was hard to agree on anything. Yet, gradually, we realized we had no other options. Suddenly, it turned out we work well together. Nice to hear. <laughs> and we've you to thank for it. Had we not met you, nothing would have come of our quarrels but heartache. Thank you, Witcher. Glad I could help. It's fortunate we resolved our differences, made peace. Had Father's cognac recipe gone to waste, I'd not have forgiven any of us. Such a shame. Father would be mighty proud. Another interesting thing here is that one of them will offer you better prices than most vendors. And finally, it seems that they put up a painting of their father on one of the walls. I tried it and it's not there unless you finish the quest in that specific way. And what's more, for some reason the painting is being highlighted by your Witcher's senses, even though I couldn't find a way to interact with it. And finally, I have to thank Ellen, once again, for letting me know that this is actually inspired by a painting of Sigmund Freud. Alright, moving on to number 5. What you may have missed here are several clues that reveal the existence of Siana and the fact that there is some kind of shady activity surrounding the royal family. The first one is a note which can be found in the barn right next to the cockatrice inn. It urges people to wake up and claims that they're being... <laughs> by the ruling elite. It goes on to say that there is an elder daughter that should be the one in charge instead of the younger one who is currently being forced upon the population. It ends by urging the people reading it to revolt and it is signed by a concerned subject. Now that last part is curious because it may actually support that vampire conspiracy theory I talked about. Do you remember the notes in Novigrad signed by a concerned citizen? As you know, those were written by a vampire. So, who knows? But going back to Siana, the next clue you can find is in the Knight Errant's office. There is a book called The Ducal Chronicle. An excerpt from it talks about how the Ducal family once visited Queen Calante of Sintra, who, for those of you who don't know, is Ciri's grandmother. Anyway, it also mentions the Duke's two daughters, Siana and Anna Henrietta and the fact that before we know it, they'll be all grown up and having to be married. It goes on to say that Siana won't have any trouble because she looks really good, but Anna, on the other hand, is a bit too skinny and has a weird hair color, so she may have some issues. I think it's fair to say that she grew up into a fine lady, but regardless, there is a second book, which is actually an amended version of the same book, The Ducal Chronicle, and it tells the exact same story except for the fact that it completely erases Siana from it, even suggesting that the Ducal family only had one daughter. So I guess Siana wasn't exaggerating when she talked about her past, and even though that may not excuse her actions, it makes them a little easier to relate to, in my opinion. Oh, and of course, I mentioned that in my previous videos, but once again, you can actually see a painting of the Ducal family at that same place, which has Siana looking rather displeased and also wearing the royal jewel. Finally, I can't help but wonder what the problem was with Anna's hair. It seems quite similar to her mother's, and even her father's as far as I can tell, and if the painting is to be believed, it is actually Sianna's hair color that doesn't fit with the rest of her family. Moving on to number 6, they get a little shorter from here on I think. This particular one is about the pile of bodies that is being burned in the arena. You can see this after the Night of Long Fangs, you know, where the vampires attack Beauclair. The smoke can actually be seen from quite a long distance, and without a doubt, these have to be the bodies of all of Detlaf's victims. Okay, number 7, we go back to the boot black real quick. For this one, I have to thank a lady by the name of Christine L, and it's the fact that you can chat with him before ever searching for Detlaf. What's more, the next time you meet him, there is a reference to your previous meeting as well. Heartfelt greeting, sir. Allow me to say you look wonderful. Almost figure, trim, a stunning ensemble. But your feet, 
Those feet could stand to look better. As it happens, I'm a boot black. Though the name's ill-fitting, for in truth, I am a foot beautifier. And a smooth talker, that's clear. Could be, probably am. But in my trade, the clumsy tongued go nowhere. Besides, I speak a lot, but every word's the truth. For example, I'm the most professional professional in all Toussaint, see? Sure, I see. I do hope you'll grace me with your custom. I need coppers in heaps to buy herbs for my sick father. He suffers terribly, the poor man. Take care now. Come early, come often. I'll perfect your look, and not only yours, but every man's woman's child's. Greetings, Sir Witcher. You've a generous heart. Surely you'll give custom and perhaps spare a tip to a poor lad working to support his sick mum. Last time I came by, your father was sick. For he was. But he got better. Now mum's taken ill, but she'll get better too, once I've earned a bit of coin for her herbs. Now that I think about it, if I combine all the details involving the boot block in this series, I can probably make uh, details you missed about the boot block video. And also to those people who in my last video said that this woman is voiced by the same person who does the boot block. Oh my! Oh! <laughs> that is absolutely true. She also does the brothel owner. What brings you to Tucson? Tell me. Hmm. Let's call it business. Ah, then. A professional journey. Nothing but work, tension, unfamiliar beds. One needs a way to relax at times. Perhaps my girls could help you. Interested in the unusual. Got a special request. Just need to keep this between you and me. You know, well, I shouldn't. Hey, who cares? How might I help? Gwent. You play? And speaking of the brothel, let's move on to yet another quick detail that you may have missed. Oh boy, another one. What's that? So, number eight. Did you know that on the top floor of said brothel, there's a woman who is churning butter in a very um, peculiar position in front of a client? Well, if you didn't, now you do. Moving on to number nine. This one is about Marlene, the woman who was cursed by Gontor Odim. You know how if you break the curse and let her stay at Corvo Bianco, she can send you back to get a reward from her old home. Well, the item is a reference to the Golden Joystick Award, which The Witcher 3 won. And if you look at it, it is an actual golden joystick, called the Golden Stick of Joy. You can even put it somewhere in your home. Alright, and finally, for number 10, I have a few quick references to various things some of which I found myself, but others were shown to me by you guys, the viewers. So, here they go. Barnabas Basil Fawlty is a reference to Basil Fawlty from this show. If I'd only listened to Mr. Fawlty, none of this fiasco would have occurred. Oh, <laughs> I, I'd just like to tell you that such a cock-up has never occurred... Next up, the husband, killed by the lesbian Bruxa, is actually a French football player. There is a notice left over here by William Shakespeare. Your boots could use some polish, Vacrant. There's a Calvin and Hobbes easter egg over here, except that Hobbes is a panther. Next up, the armor you find in the lair of the Unseen Elder is a reference to Dracula's armor. I feel like a, a person still trapped within a, a, a car wreck. There's a note about a man who murders people in gruesome ways over here, as well as some evidence of people having been murdered. Um, but anyway, his name translates to Edgar Chiselhands, which has got to be a reference to Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> and finally, there's a painting by... how is this name pronounced? Edouard Manet. And it's that his painting is subtly recreated during this cutscene. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, my lieges, uh, forgive me for being forward, but have you perchance seen a set of paints and brushes nearby? Eugenie, 
I believe this peasant wants something from us. Out of all the things I mentioned in number 10, I think this one is my favorite. And with that, we are done. The final episode of Blood and Wine. I had an absolute blast recording and trying all kinds of different stuff in this amazing expansion. I am a little sad to leave it, especially with all the bright colors. However, the time has come to go back to White Orchard and Velen. So stay tuned for details about these areas in the near future. But until then, thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my supporters and to those of you who helped me by leaving all these interesting comments. Once again, I forgot to do my customary interruption where I ask you to like and subscribe and all that. So if you're still watching and you haven't, Feel free to do so, and until the next video, stay tuned and be good.